So my name is Sewell Sullivan. Um, you met me earlier this morning, um, and I have full disclosure here. Yes, I am chair of Invictim, but I am also proudly a member of the Operation Canova Victim Focus Group, as Mary is. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce your panel that's going to be speaking next, and it is on um, a, a massive investigation taking place in Northern Ireland uh, called Operation Canova, and it's, a, the, it's entitled A Framework for Legacy Investigations. So the panelists will discuss Operation Canova, an investigation into the alleged state agents in Northern Ireland. From the onset, the leadership established a framework that integrated a victim-centered approach in all aspects of the investigation, setting best practice for legacy investigations. And I have to say, it is just an honour to present to you your panel today. I have the privilege of knowing all of the people on this stage and have worked with them for many years, and their commitment and passion for making sure that the families are front and centre in this investigation um, um, is something you're going to hear about today, and that is why it is being seen as a legacy investigation. So I'd like to first introduce your moderator, who you met briefly this morning, um, which is John Parkinson. John is a former UK Chief of Police with experience of leading counterterrorism investigations and operations, including the 7-7 London bombings. Uh, inquiry into Leeds and acted as a UK Senior National Coordinator for Counterterrorism. He is a past president of the Leadership and Counterterrorism Alumni Association and a current member of the Executive Advisory Board and Executive Director. So John, it is a pleasure to welcome you as moderator. Next I have John Boucher. John is also a former uh, Chief Constable and is the current lead for Operation Canova. And third is M Maria McDonald. Now Maria and I go back a ways and I uh, have the privilege of working here on a regular basis. Maria is the Deputy Director, Victim Strategy Lead for the Ontario Provincial Police. She is also a founding member of Invictim and a member of Operation Canova Victim Focus Group. She has also done many, many other things, but I will leave it to them to tell a little bit about and turn it over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, both of my guests, as Sue's already alluded to, are very strong uh, advocates uh, for both victims' rights uh, and supporting families. And I don't think I could ever do them justice, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves as I uh, hand over. I just want to say once again what a privilege it is for, for us to be here, and particularly on behalf of, of LINKED, uh, that we can support what a fabulous event this is. Um, I did 34 years in law enforcement and then a further 10 subsequently, working extensively uh, internationally and related to CT matters. And I have to say that Operation Canova, and the more I've learnt about it from our various conferences and speaking to John directly, uh, Canova stands out as a model in its consideration for victims' issues. There may be some in this room that don't know much about the issues in Northern Ireland over the years, so I thought I would just take a moment, and I've done this with the good grace of John's team, who've prepared a, an excellent brief, uh, which no doubt he will talk about more in, in later in terms of his reporting, just to set out some of the context in which this uh, investigation has taken place or is taking place. So the, the context for Operation Canova is that it focuses on the troubles, uh, as, as it's known in inverted commas, in Northern Ireland, which lasted almost 30 years. It was a conflict of, of nationalism, unionism and religious differences. Between 1966 and 2006, there were 3,720 conflict-related deaths, 40,000 people injured, and 213,000 people are today experiencing significant mental health problems as a direct consequence to those troubles. In context, the population of the whole of Northern Ireland is 1.8 million, which is about a tenth of the size of the population of New York City. The police in Northern Ireland, then called the Royal Ulster Constabulary, or the RUC, went from policing, where serious and organised crime was relatively rare, to the second most dangerous police force in the world, second only to El Salvador. Not sure what they were doing there, but it was obviously bad. Uh, during the course of the conflict, over 302 police officers and 18 former officers were murdered, 10,000 injured and 300 severely disabled. The UK response at that time was to deploy military personnel in peacetime to support the police 
and subsequently over 250,000 armed service personnel undertook a tour of duty there. Between August 1969 and July 2007, uh, 1,441 soldiers died, 722 of those directly as a result of terrorist acts, others in related causes. One of the most notable paramilitary organisations involved, the IRA, I'm sure everybody's heard of those, developed into one of the most sophisticated terrorist groups in the world. And it's estimated that they uh, directly were responsible to 1,700 plus deaths. So now we come on to Operation Canova as such. The Good Friday Agreement in 1998 was an intended and largely successful uh, political resolution to the Troubles. But there remained, as you would expect, many legacy issues. There has been a number of reviews and historical inquiries, and the latest, and probably the greatest, I would say, Operation Canova, was originally set up as an independent investigation into the criminal activities of an alleged agent and criminal offences by the security forces. Some of those have been subject to books and movies which you may have seen or read about. Far from a straightforward task, John Boucher and his team were specifically asked to investigate a number of unsolved murders, including those of police officers and the criminal and terrorist activities of a notorious faction. And in total, Operation Canova is investigating over 200 cases of murder, abduction and other serious terrorist acts. As you can imagine, this has had a long-standing effect on victims and families, and John has put support for those families uh, and victims right at the very centre of Operation Canova. The investigative approach is underpinned by a set of key principles that he established. The first, an unwavering focus towards victims and their families. The second, an unfettered access to information. Third, transparency and openness and fourth, an unbiased and fair approach to everyone, because families often had no contact with the police after the murder of a loved one. In fact, in many cases, they were not even made aware about the details of an inquest or an investigation due to the security situation. Family liaison coordinators, as we know them in the UK, have been central to securing trust and confidence of Canova families, and some key learning has developed from their deployment. One, the importance of personal contact, the importance to give families direct support and understand the information as well as, <laughs> that they deserve, as well as insist, assisting in the investigations. Secondly, reassurance. John makes personal contact with the victim's families at the start of each of the particular lines of inquiry, and he listens to their concerns and tries to answer any questions and better understand those experiences, and we're going to explore those in more detail shortly. And finally, building trust and confidence, because once families have got that kind of trust and confidence back, many have been able to provide information now that they've never felt able to provide previously. So although there are 33 files on, on cases, including serious offences such as murder and abduction, are currently being reviewed by the Director of Public Prosecutions in Northern Ireland, obtaining sufficient evidence in offences, many of which occurred up to 40 years ago, is never easy and very difficult. However, John, I think through his commitment to that first principle of unwavering support to families, has reassured them that every family will be provided with a written report detailing what Canova has been able to discover about their loved one and the circumstances surrounding their death. So I'm now going to move over into more of a conversational question and answer session with uh, John and Maria to try and uh, expand and unpack some of those issues. So perhaps first, John and Maria, could I just ask you to introduce yourselves, please, and then we'll move into the first uh, questions. Maria? Ladies first. Ladies okay, first. Ladies first. Okay. So um, I don't think, first of all, I suppose what I wanted to say, there's a big difference between who we are or what we do. And that's what people think. But the reality is, I think, for most people in this room, they're one and the same. And I think it was Mahatma Gandhi that said, 
uh, be the change you want to see in the world. And I think that's what we are trying to do and what the people in the room here are trying to do. And Mary and Sue, I know that is what you are and what you do too. As to what I actually do, <laughs> um, I'm a human rights lawyer, a barrister by trade, a defence lawyer, uh, lectured for years in human rights law and other aspects of nearly every type of law in Dublin City University in Ireland. Um, and uh, currently, uh, I'm, I'm acting as a Deputy Director of Victim Support Lead in the Ontario Provincial Police. Thank you. John. Uh, John Boucher. So, uh, similar to John, as I explained in the introduction, I did 36 years as a police officer, uh, retired as a Chief Constable. Uh, but in 2016, I was approached to lead an investigation into an individual that had become quite notorious in the media almost mythical individual in Northern Ireland with a code name of Steak Knife, who was allegedly a agent working for the British forces whilst also being a senior member of the IRA. And he led a unit in the IRA that was responsible for finding informants. The irony won't be lost on you. He allegedly was one of the most senior informants the Brits ever had, and yet his job for the IRA was to find informants. And when those informants were identified, um, they were subjected to all sorts of awful uh, abuse and maltreatment and torture uh, in order to gain confessions that they'd been working for the British. And then if they did confess, the normal course of events was, was that they'd be executed. And that's literally all I knew when I was asked to look at those investigations. So um, having done 36 years as a detective throughout my career as a detective, actually had undercover policing in the UK, had a covert policing which deals with informants and all of those um, sensitive aspects of the tactics that we use to keep our citizens safe from organised crime and from terrorism, uh, I was asked to investigate this. Um, I have to say, and it's relevant, we'll get into some of the questions later on, um, it, it felt like a real privilege to be asked to do it, uh, but I went to get some uh, wise counsel from very senior colleagues who I had great respect for, and everybody said, do not go anywhere near <laughs> Northern Ireland. Do not touch it. It is a graveyard uh, from the troubles of all those poor victims, and it's also a graveyard for reputations. Um, there were a number of previous inquiries that had been conducted into Legacy by extremely well-respected people. Judges, a very esteemed Canadian judge called Judge Corey, sadly now passed away. Uh, a judge from the, from the Republic of Ireland, Judge Smithick, did an inquiry into collusion uh, between the Guard of the Irish Police and the IRA. And an ex-commissioner in the Met, Lord John Stevens, had done three different inquiries. I spoke to all of them and their teams, and they all said, uh, don't go anywhere near it, other than John Stevens, who is slightly mad anyway, so that probably <laughs> explains why he said you can do it. Um, but... That's what tipped me to doing this job. I went home one day from again seeing somebody, it was Hugh Ward actually, who was an ex-chief consul of Northern Ireland, and Hugh said, don't, don't do the job, don't go anywhere near it. And I went home and I was in my kitchen and I spoke to my wife, Heidi, I said, what, what is it? Why, why does everybody say don't do this job? She said, I wish they'd tell you to do it because then you wouldn't be interested. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know what struck me? And it was this, that if that's what the senior police officers and senior officials, and I spoke to people in the security service who are great friends and colleagues of mine because of the work I've done, are saying don't do it, what must it be like for the families who haven't had any investigations? And that was the thing that kept me awake at night, one night, thinking how can it be that they've not had an investigation, which I presumed they would have done. And that was the tipping point as to why, as to why I did it. Um, we'll get into some of the mechanics of it, because I know John's got a number of questions, but one thing I will say, and it will probably come out towards the end, this has been far harder than it should be. It really has. I've had battles with really close personal friends who work in other organisations about getting access to information. Um, and I got another great quote from John Miller today. The one today I'll come to, but one he gave me a while ago, and John works with us uh, in trying to give these families the best investigation we possibly can. But when I'm not getting the information I want, John said to me rather perfectly, John, when there's a problem getting the information, 
there's a problem with the information. And he was right, because they don't want the security forces, who I'm a, obviously a huge fan of, and did a brilliant job in Northern Ireland, but they don't want to, um, they don't want to give those boxes up. Often they don't know what's in those boxes, but they don't want to give those boxes up. And the other Miller quote, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions, this morning was that the government have an obligation to put this right. And the government have an obligation to put right what happened in Northern Ireland, because we were on a side of that conflict. And I say we as a, an ex-police officer and a member of, uh, you know, a head of a big investigation. We were on the right side, I say to all families of this. Some families don't like me saying that, but I say I believe we're on the right side. But that doesn't mean we were always right. And often we were not right. And there's a context and, context and circumstances as to why things went wrong, which we need to explain. But what we shouldn't do is keep the boxes locked up, because that just um, fails society. And we have got, as John pointed out this morning, we've got an obligation to put that right which is what we're trying to do, basically, on Canova. Thanks, John. Um, you mentioned there had been previous inquiries, Lord Stevens, uh, several judges. So they would all have, I'm sure, at the time, said that they'd done their best to uncover whatever it is they were investigating. So why is Canova different? So in, in fairness to them, and John Stevens was very public on this, John Stevens... Um, to give you uh, an example of the challenges John had. So he was the most senior police officer in the UK conducting an inquiry, and he went to speak to the military uh, about whether they had recruited informants in Northern Ireland, the uh, unit that um, would have been responsible for the covert activity of the British military. And they said they didn't recruit any informants. They just lied to him. And when John asked for access to information, he was told that those records no longer existed when they did exist. So it's been a perennial uh, and continuing problem that there's a culture of resistance uh, to any examination of the security forces and what we did in Northern Ireland. And I think that's entirely misplaced. And I think it's misplaced for a couple of reasons. Firstly, those police officers, over 300, I, I obviously investigate a number of police officers' murders and meet their families and, and become good friends with their families. We've let them down. Those families felt wrongly, um, because they'd never had a proper investigation, that their husbands had been, or fathers had been sacrificed um, to protect informants in Northern Ireland. That's not what happened, but that's the belief that they had when I met them, and we subsequently found out exactly what happened in each of those cases, and there are files in with the prosecutor on those. Um, we have listened to, and I know there's possibly some lawyers in the room, we as organisations have incredible support, and we have great lawyers. But those lawyers work for NYPD, or the FBI, or MI5, or the Police Service of Northern Ireland, or MI6. They don't work for the families. They don't necessarily work for the good of society. They work to protect the reputations of those organisations. And what I've found consistently in all those other inquiries is that the lawyers, for reasons of national security, would say that information didn't have to be passed to those investigations. Now, that is where we definitely got it wrong, because the law is actually on the families and the victim side, and it's on the investigators' side. And that's something, and I'm probably saying this for the first time publicly, that in a report that I'm doing, which will probably get quite a lot of uh, attention, and I'm not criticising those lawyers because they just give the advice, but where we've made mistakes. We should have made sure that lawmakers and the law enforcers, we are not just equally uh, responsible for uh, acting lawfully, we're actually held to a higher standard. And for reasons I think Mary and other victims in here um, probably felt uh, frustration and anger after 9-11 and trying to get answers to questions, those families have tried to get answers to questions and at every single legal twist and turn they've been stopped. Yeah. And now I think, you know, we've got past that, so we're now able to get that information. 
Maria, question for you, but also I'm sure John will touch on this. Given that you think now that you've, we've reached a stage with Canova that is a, what we would describe as an Article 2 or a human rights compliant investigation, why has it taken so long to get to that point? Um, I think John touched on that a moment ago. It's the, an access to justice issue and the lack of sometimes independence in actually facilitating and even enabling that to happen. And I think what John has done with Operation Canova and his team is that they have been completely independent in the manner by which they looked at this investigation, regardless of whatever means by which or doors which were closed in their face. Um, and I think that really has been the key difference in relation to how Operation Canova has, and has acted and continues to act versus the challenges from a political perspective, which, if you're not familiar with Northern Ireland, are really quite significant. And I know you, you alluded to at the very, very start. So what, what do you think those delays and those repeated earlier investigations have done in terms of um, the effect it might have had on victims and families? Do you think it's become, they've become more entrenched in their sort of lack of trust and views or, or not? Well, I, was, I had the pleasure of being at the United Nations yesterday, the first global congress supporting and recognizing victims of terrorism. And one of the panels uh, focused on um, recognition and remembering. And they're two very different things. But how can you actually recognize the, or a state recognize the death of a loved one when it hasn't been properly or appropriately actually investigated in those circumstances? Um, and similarly, how can they truly remember their loved one in the manner by which they saw them? And to John's point a moment ago, how they thought somebody died actually was not what happened. And they are living with that for generations and the multi-generational trauma that can happen and arise as a result of that. Thank you. And, and John, you've set off with very laudable aims and you've talked about this extensively at, at many of our events previously and you've reiterated it today at the point of publishing certainly an initial report. So six years on, do you think you're going to achieve what you set out to achieve in terms of that support to victims and families? Um, do you know, when I started this, I think I, I look back now and I've got I've obviously got a, a, a better understanding about Northern Ireland. This has been the biggest learning curve of my entire professional career. I'd say also, you know, personally, actually, as well, because I've met this incredible group of families from all sides. There are nationalist families, loyalist families, security force families, military police, all who've been let down by us uh, for different reasons. And I think now I've got a different perspective on what I probably originally intended to do. Originally, rule of law guy, people said they've never had an investigation. I think a lot of people in this room are from law enforcement agencies have probably fought throughout their careers to prove that whatever sexual orientation you've got, whatever race you're from, we will always try to our best for you, investigate crimes and bring you know, to justice anybody who's committed terrible offences against you. With Northern Ireland, I think it's been it's been a journey whereby we have given those families an opportunity to actually tell their story. You mentioned a lot of families had never seen a police officer. Um, you know, even when a, a husband or a father or a mother was murdered, the police never went to the family's door. It was neighbours who explained that they'd been killed. Police officers never spoke to the nearest and dearest because of the conflict, because of the environment, and, and it's important I, I put that context uh, in front of you all in a moment, but those families just to have the opportunity to explain the last time they saw their loved ones, what friends and neighbours have said, what journalists have said to them, what they've seen in documentaries that they wanted to question because there's been so many films and books written about so many of these cases, and nobody has ever corrected any inaccuracies because nobody knows the information. So to be able to go through this journey with those families um, has been, I think, cathartic for them. I think it's released them from um, a psychological sort of trap where they felt that everybody was against them. The authorities weren't interested. They couldn't speak within their communities about these crimes because to do that was dangerous. If you spoke about anything, um, you know, that could come back at you because of the threats that existed. 
So that's probably been something that I've not expected to the degree that it's happened. Okay. Uh, and it, it's important I just give the context, John, sorry about these investigations, because of the police officers. Those police officers never knew on any given day if it was their turn that they might be a target. And when you are dealing with what happened during the Troubles, the volume of murders and crime, no organisation in the world could have dealt with it. NYPD couldn't have dealt with it. You know, the FBI couldn't have dealt with it. The British security forces couldn't deal with it, where you could investigate those cases. The volume, it was impossible. Then there's the threat. Not only did you not know if it would be your turn that day when you drove out of your house or you drove into the police station that, you know, you were being targeted. You also couldn't go and see victims of crime. You couldn't do house-to-house -house inquiries if we do them. You couldn't, even with the limited forensic capabilities in the 70s and 80s, you couldn't do the sort of forensic work that you'd want to do. And you also, and this is the important difference in Northern Ireland, those investigators often didn't get the information that the intelligence agencies had about who committed those offences. Because of this vicious cycle that exists in Northern Ireland, to give that information to investigators that might mean those investigators are going to arrest people would put the person who gave that information at risk. Because how would the police possibly have known to go and arrest mm. John Parkinson? And so we got into a systemic position where lots of intelligence came in and it just sat there. And we have got people who are committing murder after murder after murder. It's a small community who are committing these crimes who continue to do it. So victims think that's collusion. Mm. Victims think that's us deliberately allowing this to happen. It was an incredibly hostile environment. The problem I think that um, I particularly uh, get frustrated with is since the Good Friday Agreement, when things were safer to deal with investigations and to go and speak to families, we have continued to kick that can mm. down the road. We've stopped those investigations from happening, which it has been a, a re-traumatising of all those families who've legally had to go to every possible court, ombudsman, complaints processes, and have never got the sort of um, wholesome investigation that they deserve. And, and as I understand it, both, again, for both John and Maria, uh, you talked about legal challenges. You've mentioned the reluctance of some of the agencies that have been involved, the organisations, the official government departments, that will have had legal challenges, no doubt, about supporting your investigation. And yet many of the victims, I suspect, will have had less of an ability to have that kind of legal representation and challenge on an equal footing. So how, do, how does that manifest itself in the victim's perspective? Well, I think, again, it's the David and Goliath thing. You, you, you get to understand how difficult it's been for these families. And by the way, there's another important point to make. When I first started this, somebody said to me, are you going to be meeting a load of IRA families, almost tarnishing them with, you know, being terrorists? That wasn't the case at all. You know, most of the families I've met have got, um, you know, uh, an understandably, uh, a real angst against violence. They're not involved in any paramilitary activity. Um, a very few of the cases I'm investigating, people are involved in paramilitary activity. And the families, of course, are entirely innocent. And because of the type of offences we're looking at, and I'm sure people will be alive to this in this room, if your loved one was killed because they're accused of being an informant, you as a family were ostracised, you were demonised in the community. Lots of awful, awful treatment then happened. And by the way, that's generational, so it continues today. And that, that's, that's never been addressed, that's never been apologised for by those people who stood up and almost did a call to arms for the community to um, treat these families in this way. And the reason they did that and that was the IRA leadership, was to deter people from becoming an informant. Because it wasn't just you that would put your life at risk if the IRA found out, but your family would then not be able to exist in society, your children, your grandchildren, for generations to come. And that's still a stain, unfortunately, that, that, yeah. that we face. Maria, John's just touched on this. Yeah. It's not just about the sort of direct... Uh, next of kin, there's a much broader uh, sort of perspective about the breadth of victims that have been directly and tangibly affected. Could you just touch on what your experiences of that are? Yeah, and just before I do, if I can go to the point that, that John made there, is because justice means different things to different people. Mm. 
um, but that there has to be a balance between the rights of the victim and the fights that they had to go through in Northern Ireland to get where they are versus the right to retain information from a security perspective. Mm. And I really don't think, and I think John would agree with me here, that balance didn't exist in that context. And the harm and damage and pain and multi-generational trauma that exists because the families have had to continue to fight in those circumstances for every piece of information or for any true clear investigation. Um, and that loses trust in the system, in government, and then to your experience, John, when you came in, notwithstanding that it was supposed to be independence, the lack of actual belief that this time it was going to be any different to anything else. Mm, yeah. And so to the question you just asked a moment ago, um, as it relates to everyone in this room, the circles of impact, and we heard, you know, we're here remembering 9-11. Um, um, and the, the, the vast families that are continue to be impacted that, the first responders um, from a health perspective. Um, and really it's no different in the context of the multi-generational trauma, which you heard me say a moment ago that exists there. But if I can maybe just give you a personal Please. experience. Um, so I think a lot of people, it, you know, in the, in the context of Northern Ireland, you know, Northern, it, we, I'm from the South, the Republic of Ireland, and we really have been, and I know you'll speak to this in a moment, maybe to give it a little bit more context, John, and maybe actually, if, if you might actually, before I speak, maybe you could just speak to the impact from a Republic perspective versus the Northern perspective as it relates to the events that are in, around the Troubles. So, I, firstly, I have to say I have no jurisdiction in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, the South of Ireland, but... Um, one of the cases that I'm looking at is a case known as the Glenang Gang. We've identified 127 murders that the Glenang Gang uh, were responsible for in the 70s. One of those attacks was uh, the worst atrocity, actually, on a given day during the conflict, was the Dublin and Monaghan bombings on the 17th of May 1974. Dublin and Monaghan in the south, not the north. Um, but the offences were committed by a loyalist paramilitary organisation, so the, on the other side to the IRA, uh, who uh, basically drove car bombs down to the south Friday afternoon, uh, busy Dublin uh, afternoon. There was a bus strike, lots of people walking around uh, trying to get in and out of Dublin city centre when three bombs went off in Dublin and one in Monaghan and 33 people were, were butchered. Uh, and many, many life-changing injuries. Uh, in fact, there was one family, a, a husband and wife, and their two small children uh, um, who, were, who, were, who were killed. And that particular attack, uh, and it reinforces some of the issues that I've mentioned about now, because this isn't just a, a North and the IUC, the Royal Worcester Constabulary issue. That particular at the Garda, and I have sympathy for all the different perspectives here, but the Garda closed the investigation in the Dublin bomb attacks that occurred on the 17th of May. They closed that investigation on the 11th of August of that year. Monaghan, which was one car bomb the same afternoon uh, on the 17th of May, that investigation closed on the 7th of July. Now that's probably the biggest attack that there has been uh, for this nation of Ireland that they've experienced. And not a lot of other work happened after that. Nobody prosecuted for those crimes. Now, those families um, listened to the Prime Minister that night on the television, the Taoiseach, say that no stone would be left unturned. One family member, when I first met him, who still never met a Garda to talk about this, he survived, and nobody's asked him if he saw one of those cars parked, all the basic inquiries you'd expect to ask a survivor of a crime like that. Did you see this particular car? Did you see who was driving it? He said he doesn't think he knows of one stone that the guard actually picked up. Never mind, no stone would be you know, left unturned. And that, that has left such a difficult psychological barrier between those families and the authorities. And um, we've now gone down there, and in fairness to the Irish government, they've introduced some new legislation to give me information, which. Uh, we have faced some real challenges with getting recently, but there's new, a new law in Ireland sharing information with me now. Um, those families, it, it, you know, 
we can recover this situation. We can put it right, as, as John has sort of described, that obligation is there still on governments. But we need to act now before it's too late. It'll be 50 years in the anniversary for that offence in 2024. The anniversary falls on a Friday. The memorial for that offence is outside a pub and people use it to urinate on. And it's not a very good memorial. And there's an organisation called Justice for the Forgotten about those victims. And you couldn't really get a more suitable name for those victims. And it's now 2022. So I think, you know, the work we're doing is, is putting a lot of these... Uh, issues um, or recurring a lot of these issues but it's far harder than it should be and I know Maria has a personal experience with regards to those particular attacks uh, with a family member. Well I suppose when you ask the question about the circles of impact um, you know a lot of people of my generation wouldn't know about those bombings hmm. um, and I, I think that there's a real risk in forgetting uh, how it's happened and what happened. I was familiar with the Monaghan bombing in the context that my father's from the town and I knew he lost someone up the road, a friend. However, it was only after I had been actually working uh, on the Victims Focus Group with Operation Canova that he shared with me that um, on that same day, my uh, uncle was in Dublin at the time, um, and my grandmother, obviously the bomb had occurred, and there was significant fear as to relation to whether he was okay in that moment. But also there was a bombing that happened under dock, and um, my father happened to be working in the office across the road, and left early to go to the Christmas party, and um, the bomb went off. People were injured that he knew. Um, and though he never had told me that, I never knew that even there was an awareness in relation to any of those pieces. And I think that's part of our history that is lost because, again, to the questions earlier, if you're not investigating them, you're not recognizing them, no. and you're not remembering them. And that's why it's so essential that the work that John do, is doing uh, is, is actually brought to the fore. And also, I was on... Um, I used to do a lot of radio around victims, generally speaking, and I spoke to some of the work as it relates to the troubles and uh, John's work, um, generally. And someone phoned in and said, um, I was a victim of the Dundalk bombing and I've never got help and I've never heard anyone on national radio speak to this before, that there might even be help for me. Wow. So that, again, if we're not talking about it, you know, history has a as we've seen at the moment, as is a way of repeating itself again and again and again. And again, yesterday at, at, at the UN, quite a remarkable uh, uh, woman spoke to the events that we know are very familiar in Spain in relation to the terrorist events around Asia. Hmm. And the work that they are doing there in relation to the youth, because the youth have forgotten necessarily what has happened there. Yeah. We don't remind them and remind ourselves of how these things can happen, then in those circumstances, how are we going to prevent the use of today to be potentially radicalized because they believe that they need to use violence in order to meet their political aims? Because we're not having those conversations of the harm and impact. And I, I don't know, John, I suppose for you is that, you know, people have had peace in Northern Ireland for so long. One would say peace uh, since the Good Friday Agreement. And with that peace, comes, um, you know, complacency. Yeah. Um, and with complacency, if we've never investigated and we don't continue to investigate and we don't do it properly, then there is no accountability necessarily or the people who may choose to take that path in the future, mm. um, they, in those circumstances, don't see any accountability for the past actions. What would prevent them from doing future acts? Well, you, 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 you make a good point. One thing I would say about the whole thing with Northern Ireland, let's face it, incredibly difficult circumstances. And for the security forces, sometimes there's no right decision. But what I would say is this. What sets us apart as the five eyes, I hope, as working democracies, is that if we get things wrong, and we will get things wrong, because uh, we're human beings, not robots. But where we get things wrong, we don't hide those issues away. We look at them, 
Um, we show people what we did and how we did what we did, why we did what we did, and then we learn from any mistakes. We're not demonizing people, because these are impossibly difficult circumstances in which people are operating. But where the security force has been involved in killings in any way whatsoever, either not acting on information or agents working with the security forces have killed people, um, or we have um, even worse than either of those two situations, which I'm sure some of you can probably understand the context of, but where security forces or members of security forces have deliberately gone out, as I would say, putting a balaclava on and putting a gun in their hand and gone and committed murder. Where we don't investigate those issues, where we just keep quiet about them, there is a void, a vacuum. And that void and vacuum is very quickly occupied by the conspiracy theorists mm. and by people who just put misinformation out there. And what does set us apart is where we do get things wrong, we explain with transparency and honesty what we did and why we did it, and we demonstrate that that could not happen again. Now, with these cases, these families still feel, and this is a societal issue that goes to your point, Maria, that nothing's moved on because information is still being withheld. And I, I, I want to correct up something on that now, but it feels to these families that nothing's really changed. There's no proper process to investigate these cases. They've got nowhere to go. They've got nowhere to go to get their case investigated. By putting in place a Canova, and Canova should be uh, available to all victims of the Troubles, they can begin to see actually, and a, a number of families I've seen recently, that in a number of the cases, bear in mind that context I've given you, the police did a good job. Mm. They really did do quite a good job. But a lot of those families think that the police officers, they never went to their door, they never arrested anybody, they didn't care. And we've explained to families, actually, shortly after this murder, 10 people were arrested, six people were arrested, five people were arrested, seven searches occurred. But because the police wouldn't go and speak to the families for understandable reasons, the families have no knowledge of any of that. Now, that didn't happen in every case. But we have been, I think, resetting and um, accurately setting out for families what actually happened. And for those families and their children to move forward, the generational thing, we have to do that. Because otherwise, we might be a Russia or a China. They've been mentioned in this room today. We're different because we will look at these things independently and properly. Yeah. Um, the Troubles has been a problem for the UK for, for a long time. I understand why, but we have got to put that right. I don't think anybody in this room would disagree, John, that you face some uh, remarkable challenges. Can I just pivot just for a, a moment, please, a brief moment about the leadership aspect of the title that comes with being uh, in Linked? And that's about you, really. Why, why are you sort of, well, we know why you're different, but why, uh, why, what is it about you and your personal traits, I think, that A, for why you were chosen, but B, why you've chosen this path of advocacy? more so than any of your people who've gone before? So, I th I th honestly, I think some of this is timing. I think John Stevens, Judge Smithick, I mentioned, Judge Corey, there was an organisation called the Histor Historical Enquirist Team that was closed in 2014. I think they all came a bit too early. There was a lot of people still in, particularly the security services, who were involved in Northern Ireland and still very uh, protective of their organisation's role. And they lost... Oh, sorry. And they lost... Uh, they lost friends and relatives. Are we good? Can you hear me? No. No? Uh, right, I think we're on now. Uh, and they lost friends and relatives. So in the earlier years of these inquiries, and bear in mind these are individual inquiries into specific cases, there's not a police station you can go to and get your case investigated. That's just not happened in Northern Ireland. This was a whole you know, new learning experience for me. But we came along when I think there was a different attitude. I have got, had, I hope I've still got some relationships with the security services. I had strong relationships with the security services because of the 7-7 bombings and all the stuff that we've done before. Um, but those relationships have been tested. 
and we we have got into quite confrontational uh, legal uh, positions against each other. But legally and morally, uh, and, and I have to say, I'm going to again compliment Linked here because um, it's been a bit difficult to, on occasions. Legally and morally, though, I know I'm right. But a lot of the organisations, with the lawyers telling the leadership and even members of the government and senior civil servants, are pushing back against me doing the report I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to do it. And that just keeps this group of victims and society held back in time. They're not going to be able to move forward and trust in government and trust in society unless we show that we are that working democracy. So I think that's kept me going because when I do think, am I the actual one that's wrong here? And I'm, I'm not playing the game that people want me to play in the authorities or the establishment. I'll speak to a John Miller or I'll speak to Mary Fetchett or I'll speak to Mike Downing from Link or Cathy O'Toole, who's the ex-chief of Boston because I've introduced a number of groups which uh, are populated from people that I've met in this sort of environment who, you know, do not just talk about being victim-focused or don't just talk about honesty and integrity because we can all do that. We can all write it in the pamphlets, but demonstrate it. And sometimes demonstrating it is pretty tough, but having that support has been... Um, I think probably the difference that the people on those groups that I have helping me, which is a victims focus group, an independent steering group that John, John's on with six incredibly internationally well-regarded people, and an independent governance board with people from Northern Ireland who are incredibly well-regarded, um, religious figures, um, they all get it. And that's probably been why I think we've got where we are, John. Really. Can I can I come in here as well? Of course, uh, um, You know, having worked with John over the course of the last few years in relation to when it first started and, and where we came from and where we are right now, I mean, you know, we've, we've heard the victim-centered approach been mentioned. In my view, there's three aspects to that. First and foremost, you understand the needs of the family members. Secondly, you provide effective communication and information to them. And thirdly, you set expectations. Mm. And John has done that every single stage of that process. If I will call you, or you have called it, here's my mobile number, you can call me, you answer the phone. You've given them the information that they need and you've communicated with them before something happens or at the time of it happening. And you understand what their needs are because you went into that community, you spoke to them and you asked them. You did not presume what they needed. They told you what you needed. And certainly, as been a member of the victim focus group and with, with, with those other people in the team, you came to us and asked us when you didn't know, but you also went to the families and asked them what they yeah. needed. And that is the difference to how this has been done versus how other investigations are done internationally. I think, I think what you've both just said demonstrates really as much as anything we could ever say about the importance of these kind of collaborative networks that Mary has established, that Sue's established within Victim, and we've been fortunate enough to have established over the years with Link, because you, know, you started off, John, by saying that you spoke to many people who you regarded uh, perhaps for wise counsel about whether you should do this, and they all told you unequivocally that this was a bad idea and not to do it, and yet you still took the position that you know, this is this was the right thing to do and meant and continues to that end, but then have, have established the support network internationally, as you say, of very highly regarded uh, individuals who've been able to support you through that. So I think that, again, is a great and shining example of, of why these in networks are, and collaboration are so important. Just, just going back to the, the victims, and you've mentioned about government's uh, uh, views and about moving on, I think is a phrase that people use. And Maria, can, perhaps you could just pick up on this, because I, I know, and I'm sure there's many people who, have, who are victims advocates in this room, as I'm sure everybody is, that we hear these stories, whether they're in the, me in the media or whether they're from officials, that say, hey, some of this was 40 years ago, it's a long time ago, surely memories have faded, we need to put all this behind us, we need to move on, look to the future, forget the past. You know, how, how, how do you, we deal with that kind of sort of attitude that seems to prevail? First of all, that's not the voice of the victims or survivor. It's what the media or, or what our governments want us to do versus what that truth is. 
I think in those circumstances, we have to speak truth to power. Or as John Miller, Miller indicated, you need to have your ha a leg in a stirrup while you're doing so, as you well know too, right? So um, I think that's, that's really the, the challenge is that the voices, we have to empower the victim's voice to hear it and then to live it and to act upon it. Because it's all very well for us to hypothesize what should be done. Action is all that really matters when you're trying to build trust or create trust, if trust even existed. Because I think it's very fair to say with 40 years here, there is no trust or there was no trust. Um, and you know, it's really hard to quantify what you cannot prevent. Because the damage has already been done, so the change you're trying to affect is so significant it can only happen because you build trust over a period of time by listening to their voices. Can, can I just mention one thing about memories? Because I've been present, you know, I, I got a, sent a video clip today from a murder in 1974, and the son, it was a police officer who was murdered, the son, who was four at the time, one of the sons, has never spoken, and his brother got him to do a video clip, and he sent it to me today. The, these families, uh, this is as if it happened yesterday, but I've seen families talk to, you know, officials from government, senior civil servants, uh, ministers, and people will say to them, look, memories have now faded. The point you made, John. Well, when we speak to suspects, their memories have faded. When we speak to the cops, because of the volume of what they're dealing with, their memories have faded. But when I speak to a mother or a wife or a son, they remember the look the last look they saw as the father was taken out the door by the IRA, never to be seen again. Those that were involved in attacks where they've been in a bar and a bomb's gone off, they know exactly what music was playing. They know exactly how much drink they had left when they suffered that attack with life-changing injuries. Those victims remember everything as if it was literally yesterday. So when people talk in that way, and I understand why, I understand the sentiment of people talking about faded memories, but until those families have had a chance to be acknowledged, have their story told, and feel that somebody cares and somebody's looked at all the information, so all we do, we look at everything that still exists, every record that still exists, we talk to everybody who might be able to tell us what happened who's still alive, and we get any forensics that are available. And if we get names for suspects, they come in. It's not rocket science, that's what we do. And just by the nature of doing that and telling families what we found, they're entirely realistic about any prosecutions now. That sees those families move into a different, completely different place to where they were before. And we've also, and this is a, a new thing, you know, I would, I don't like to admit that uh, I probably wasn't particularly this soft and cuddly before, but the amount, the yeah, amount, was. Uh, the amount of support we've got for families, because in Northern Ireland you couldn't talk about this. If you spoke about your loved one who was murdered because he was suspected of being an informer for the British, you would face repercussions. The amount of really important counselling uh, and psychological support we've got for families has made a huge difference to them as individuals because they would never have trusted in speaking to anybody, even their doctors. And that's a big element for, you know, I think Canova and a success. And that comes from a lot of the victims in this room who I've met over the years who've really educated me. There's one thing I do need to say before we, at risk of finishing. This has been harder than it should be. I've had some real battles and I've lost some friends in the security forces, no doubt about that, but I'm happy that I'm on the right side of this. As Nick Caldas said, people need to get on the right side of history with this. Nick is on our steering group, who's an ex-deputy commissioner from New South Wales in Australia. But the security forces now have been super with me. In the last two years, the start was tricky. But I can honestly say now, and Dean's in the room, Dean Hayden, who's the ex-senior national coordinator, uh, Ken McCallum, the director general of MI5, is a good friend of mine. We have got into the place that all those other inquiries should have been years ago, and that we should have been in when we started this. So we are getting the information. We are in a completely different place. I just hope that 
the report that I've promised families that will be published and I'm contracted to do, which should be out before the end of this year, I just hope we get that over the line for these families. And I, and I hope that the lawyers and the, the naysayers, the doubters in the organisations, which obviously exist, and I understand why they have the view they have, I, I understand it and I respect it, but this is what needs to be done, and I just hope they get that. Can I, Thank you. Can I yes, just of course. That? So the two aspects I just wanted to speak to, because when you speak about memories, you know, we know that trauma impacts the mind and what people remember. And certainly from my experiences working as a bar barrister, um, particularly as it relates to sexual assault cases, which could be historical in nature, and I do want to draw that parallel in the context of memories, that they remember smells, they remember music, the intimate pieces of information that somebody can be instilled in somebody's mind over 40 years can be precise enough to result in successful prosecutions in certain instances. So let's not underestimate that evidence when we don't necessarily have that evidence in the first place. The other one thing I want to say is silence is a means of control. And if we never enable somebody to actually have their voice heard as to what happened on those days, the fact, particularly in the Northern Ireland context, in relation to them feeling afraid to be able to share that information, how is someone ever going to move on with their life in the fear that they have this information? In sharing it, it actually empowers people and also removes the control that whatever or whomever may have had over them in that moment. And that is the first part to what can be a very, very long journey for healing for not just that individual, potentially their family members who they may have never spoken to or never family never understood why they were the way that they were. John, John can I just ask one, one thing on that? I, um, with the families piece, because a lot of these cases have never been properly investigated, and I hope I've given the context about why that, that has been. When I meet these families for the first time, I always say, where's your lever arch files? And they look at me, but they know what I mean. Because you look in the murder box that the police have got, and you'll find six or seven pieces of paper. The families have collected everything. The families have got so much information that, you know, from previous news reports, documentaries, um, court cases, trying to go through the courts to get invest investigations conducted into their cases. And all of that is so therapeutic for them to have somebody go through all that information. And I have to tell you, they've given us letters that their loved ones were allowed to write to them while the IRA held them for those cases uh, where loved ones were accused of being informants, and often they were permitted to write a letter to their families to say goodbye. You know, we've got DNA off those letters for the suspects. We've got DNA off the stamps. But they'd never even given those letters to the police because they'd never met the police. Mm. So the opportunities, just by speaking to the families that are unlocked for an investigator, are huge. Um, so, yeah, just, just, just the importance for those families to have to have their moment to be able to talk to us about what happened. And I am going to say one thing I know our time is up. Um, if, if there was a murder 40 years ago, would we stop investigating it? No, we wouldn't. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm really mindful of time. We've just got a couple of minutes left on the, uh, uh, on the screen. There's just two things that I, I want to finish with, and then we'll see if there's any, uh, any questions before closing remarks. But. Uh, You've both mentioned this issue of uh, silence through fear and some of the mechanisms that you've put in place to help that, and I think that's going to go a long way to overcoming some of that sort of institutional lack of trust uh, that we've seen through both agencies and governments going forward. But one thing that may well, you know, be a slightly disturb. Uh, destabilizing factor, and John, perhaps you could start, Maria, you follow on this, is about the current and proposed implications of the bill that is being put forward about how we move forward or how it's suggested or proposed that we move forward beyond this and, and what that might do to all the great work that's been established already. John. So just so people know, currently through the UK government, finally, Finally, 25 years next year after the Good Friday Agreement, there is a piece of legislation to build, create an invested body to look at all these cases in Northern Ireland. These families have been waiting for this for, since the Good Friday Agreement. But there's a real lack of trust with those families, and they've read the draft bill and see it as uh, falling far short of 
what they all talk of a Canova, a really um, meaningful examination into the circumstances of how their loved ones died. Now, that lack of trust we need to overcome. The bill is not in its final form yet. It has to go through the complicated process of the House of Lords in London and then back to the House of Commons. I'm hoping the bill gets amended, because in its current form it, it does worry me a little, gets amended to a position where there can at least be a broad consensus. It's better than Canova. It builds on Canova and what we've managed to do, you know, taking the good from Canova. Um, uh, and uh, all families then get an opportunity to hopefully have the same uh, experience as the Canova families. And the fact that we've not got one Canova family offside, not one, not one, and they all were really anti-establishment. Every single family supports what we're doing. Um, this bill gives that opportunity now. Just, just uh, and the final thing, because I won't be able to get a job when my report comes out in the UK, can I can I come to CNN, John, and work at CNN? Is that okay? <laughs> That's good. Okay. We, we got a spot, but you're going to have to learn English. Okay. <laughs> Maria, I know. I know I, I'll be quick. Um, we're, we're getting a red light flashing, but I just want to ask Maria final comments on the bill. Yeah, so, so it, in my personal view, in its current form, erodes, uh, erodes the rule of law and, and the ability that is enshrined in human rights law for a fair trial and access to a fair trial for everybody, or at least a fair investigation. And what I will say is that if that erosion happens in the United Kingdom, it will happen all over the world, because that is, in my view, as a human rights approach, us in, 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 we have the privilege to have a democracy. And within that democracy, the human rights and that rule of law must exist for us to be able to continue to prosecute these cases for generations to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, listen, I'm sure we could talk about this for, uh, for hours, uh, if need be, and I've you know, had the fortune and good, good benefit to hear both John and Maria previously and had many discussions. They're both here for the remainder of the conference, and I'm sure they'd pick up any, con any questions that you might have. Um, there's a lot of remarkable people in this room, and I think you'd all want to share with me that we've got two of them sat on the uh, stage now. So thank you. Thank you. saying, yeah, why, why is he doing this, John? It's like, everyone was right, it is crazy. But no, he's, he's all over it. And the other thing, in kicking off the meeting, I talked about the framework, a framework of pulling together law enforcement, detective work, et cetera, with, and you heard Maria and her comments, and, and Mary and Voices team as part of the, kind of the family optics, the victim's optics in this, in this work. It's something that we plan to build on a lot more through uh, in victim and through our work at Voices and through, uh, through Linked. So uh, with that, we will take our lunch break. Let me tell you the plan. We're gonna reconvene at uh, 1.30. Lunch is outside uh, in, the, in the hallway. You can bring it back into this room. We'll get it cleaned up before we restart at 12.30. Um, I'm gonna give a plug again for the artwork out there because we dragged it in from Connecticut and we wanna make sure, what's that? 1.30. 1.30. Um, I got, and, and being a good nonprofit, I always do a little plug. If, if you are thinking in terms of a donation at some point, we have a little QR code on your, uh, on your desk. And thanks to our sponsors, Turk and Heath McCauley, Motley Rice, and Deary Law. We appreciate all of it, and we'll see you guys back here at 1.30. Thanks.